Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Question Show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. Our graph net charts asks, is the reason heat shields are necessary because spacecraft are traveling at roughly 20,000 miles per hour when they re enter the atmosphere. If they had a fuel source, for example, dilithium crystals, could they just slow down while they're in space and drop into the atmosphere there for not needing a heat shield? Thanks. You're exactly correct. <laughs> so like when it, think about like the physics involved, you've got a rocket that's sitting on Earth, and it, it has to escape the Earth's gravity. And so it has to accelerate itself up to the point that it's going about 28,000 kilometers per hour in a circle around the Earth. And that is orbit. And you're essentially going at the exact same speed where even though you're falling, you always miss the Earth. And so now you're going 28,000 kilometers per hour around the Earth and around and around and around. And so then you want to be able to come back to the Earth. So the one way that you could do it was you could if you had the exact copy of your rocket that took you to space, and you got out of the capsule that you're in and got into this other rocket, full rocket, full Falcon nine, with its upper stage and all of that, and then fired that rocket, you could slow yourself down to the point, or you could even land, you know, you could slow yourself down to the point that you're only going a few hundred kilometers per hour descend through the atmosphere and land nice and safely. The only problem is that you need another giant rocket. And so the trick the sort of the free ride that we get, when we try to return from orbit, is that we get to use the Earth's atmosphere to slow us down, to go from 28,000 kilometers per hour to zero. The price that we have to pay is that it's an enormous deceleration. And the only way to do that is to plow through the atmosphere and let the atmosphere slow you back down. And as you force your way through the atmosphere, that generates an enormous amount of heat, which needs to be dissipated. And that's why there's all these complicated heat shields. But I think like the price of a heat shield is nothing compared to what it would cost to have a gigantic rocket. And yeah, you can imagine some far, far future where people are using antimatter or metallic hydrogen or something like that. And instead of having to decelerate themselves and use their heat shield and get through the atmosphere, they could just stop and then just descend into the atmosphere and land. And like, think about science fiction, when you have these situations where the enterprise or whatever is coming into the atmosphere, and it's going a tremendous amount of speed, right, that ship can go almost the speed of light on its impulse engines, it can go multiple times the speed of light on its warp drive, it could hover over some spot on the earth and just gently descend down. But you know, the writers think it would be more exciting to have the spacecraft smashing its way through the atmosphere. So yeah, if we had denser fuel, then we wouldn't need to have as much of a heat shield. This guy, would we be able to observe any objects or clusters near the edge of the observable universe and infer any information from the gravitational force of mass beyond the observable universe threshold? So the question you're asking is a misunderstanding of what it is when we look out to the edge of the observable universe. If light moved instantaneously, if you could look out in any direction, and as far as you could see, you were seeing stuff that the light was traveling instantaneously, then you would be seeing the universe as it is today, no matter where you look. And so if you could look at objects that are as far away as the edge of the observable universe, you would see giant mature galaxies like the Milky Way, in sort of the present time of the universe, where the star formation is kind of winding down and lots of small dwarf galaxies have merged together and some of the larger structures are forming across the universe. But when we look out in space, we're looking back in time. And the observable universe is not the farthest that we can see. But it's the earliest that we can see, we are essentially seeing the beginning of the universe in all directions, because light travels at the speed of light. And so light has been traveling for 13.8 billion years from every point that we're seeing at the edge of the observable universe. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing the first moments that light could actually escape into the universe when all the universe was was just hydrogen, a little bit of helium, some other elements, just a giant surface of a star, like a red dwarf star, the entire universe was 
you know, 3,500 degrees Kelvin, and then it cooled down a little bit more and light could finally escape. And so if you look out all the way out and you're like, what's on the other side of that, it would just be more of this just amorphous primordial hydrogen and helium as far as you could go in the observable universe. And of course, every minute that goes by, we're able to see one more minute of observable universe. And we see just the next little bit of light that's finally being released from the early universe. So unfortunately, um, your question doesn't make sense, but I hope my answer did. Horizon Brave. So is there a gravitational limit to how massive or heavy an object can be actually sustained at a Lagrange point? Likewise, do the different Lagrange points have differing upper limits to the size of the object that can be successfully parked there? So the way Lagrange points work, right, is you've got between two massive objects, say the Earth and the Sun, there are five Lagrange points, points of relative stability. L1, 2, and 3 are lined up between the Earth and the sun and they are meta unstable, which means that any object that you put there is going to fall out of this location and require more and more fuel to get you back to that position. L4 and L5, which are on the orbit with the Earth, are meta stable, so they don't need any additional propellant to remain in that area. And the part that's missing from that equation is the thing that can be held in the Lagrange point. And I'll ignore the L1, 2, and 3 because they're meta unstable and so nothing's going to last. But L4 and L5, their other name is called the Trojan regions. And Jupiter has Trojan regions, the Earth has Trojan regions, every planet in the solar system is going to have these Trojan regions, and they have captured sort of like garbage collection, all kinds of material. And the size of the material that can be held in these Lagrange points does depend on the mass of Jupiter or the mass of Earth. And so Jupiter's Trojan regions can have asteroids that are dozens 100 kilometers across and in fact nasa has a mission called lucy that's about to fly out and explore many of these trojan objects up close earth because it's smaller has less gravity has a smaller limit to the size of the asteroids that can remain in its lagrange points and i think we've only discovered a couple and they're in the dozens of meters across size and so they're much smaller if they're any bigger then they just fall out of this and the way you sort of want to consider it is that you can have the two masses and then whatever you put in the Lagrange point has to be of negligible mass. So small asteroid, spacecraft, astronaut, um, teapot, but it can't be something bigger like very large asteroid, another planet, trapped moon, etc. Timberwolf. Will fusion reactors essentially be the doorway to almost light speed travel flipping somewhere around or past halfway to slow down? And will we be able to navigate at those speeds and using what? So fusion drives, of course, are taking advantage of this process of nuclear fusion, the thing that's done in the sun, the things done in fusion bombs, where you are merging atoms of hydrogen and helium or heavier elements and even more heavier elements. This process releases a lot of heat that heat can be used to heat up some kind of propellant and blast it out the back of your spacecraft and your spacecraft goes fast in the other direction. Now, we don't know how to generate fusion energy in any kind of sustainable way right now. But in theory, you know, we're always 30 years away from fusion. So who knows, you know, hopefully I'll still be doing this show in 30 years, and we'll have an answer to that question. But still, even if you had like giant fuel tanks of hydrogen that you brought on your spacecraft, and you they're very efficient, you still aren't going to get enough of a boost to be able to fly quickly from star to star. It's still you will, you will run out of fuel before you've accelerated very far. And so to overcome this idea, there was this idea of the bussard ramjet where you wouldn't carry any fuel tanks, but instead you would have this giant magnetic scoop that would form out in front of you. And you would be gathering up little particles of hydrogen from the interstellar medium. And so you'd be essentially collecting your fuel as you go. So you wouldn't need to have any fuel tanks on board. The problem with that is that the amount of a magnetic field that would be required to bring in these particles is incomprehensibly large. I think a recent paper said that you would need a magnetic field that would stretch from say the earth to the sun. And that would be your funnel that was pulling in. And 
we can't generate magnetic fields that are anywhere close to that. So unfortunately, the only kinds of ways of getting a spacecraft to those really, really high velocities are either some way that you can generate acceleration, but you don't have to carry the fuel on board. And that's why having some kind of laser propulsion system is probably the way that's going to work. The lasers can sit in the solar system, fire at some spacecraft with a light sail, accelerate it up to a significant portion of the speed of light, and then it's on its way. But it's the slowing back down part, which is going to be kind of tricky. You know, you need a laser at the destination that's going to fire at your spacecraft and slow it down before you can go into orbit. Otherwise, you're just going to go past the stars at 40% the speed of light, and that's not going to work. So we're going to still need like some kind of infrastructure. You can imagine some super advanced civilization has taken the time to slowly move a laser system over to the destination star system. And then once that's actually set up, then you can accelerate a spacecraft from one star system and then decelerate it as it's approaching the other star system. But it's going to take a lot of time. So unfortunately, even fusion isn't going to give you the kinds of speed that you need. Like antimatter might do the trick. It's like the most pure form of energy that you can possibly release. But right now, antimatter is incredibly expensive to generate. Cuts like 62 trillion dollars per gram to make antimatter. But maybe we'll we'll figure this out and make it faster in the future. Miguel Angel Romero. Hey, Fraser, you mentioned in the last astronomy cast that in order to have material collapse to form a star, you need it to be cold. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. So there are clouds of hydrogen all around the universe. And this is all left over from the Big Bang. All the material in the universe that we have today was really close together, so close that the first atoms could actually form. And then over time, this material has cooled down. And so the problem is, is that if you have a bunch of hot gas that is being heated by a star or being heated by a quasar or some other thing, then just like hot air rising, the gas isn't going to want to collapse down and turn into a star. The only way you're actually going to get a star is you need to have cold molecular hydrogen. And this is stuff that's, again, primordial left over from the Big Bang. It's not taking in any temperature beyond like the background temperature of the universe. And it's able to then collapse. And it's usually it has to be some event like a supernova goes off nearby and causes this material to collapse or a star passes through a region and causes ripples You get over densities. And that can begin this process of collapse. But if the gas is too hot, then the molecules are moving around too quickly and they refuse to collapse and you just can't get a star. You should watch astronomy cast listen to astronomy cast. That's the podcast that I do with Dr. Pamela Gay. And like we have just finished episode 600 and 25 35. We've done many episodes. So you should check it out. Six EQU J five Harden. Why do we have to assume that it's dark energy that is pushing outwards in our universe explosions in a vacuum have no reason to be influenced by gravity or within our universe nor to stop. So astronomers uh, back in 1998 wanted to try and calculate the expansion rate of the universe. They wanted to answer this age old question, which is like, is the universe expanding outward, decreasing in density at a rate that it will eventually come to a halt and then it will collapse back in on itself? Or will it expand and then just slow down and come to a halt at sort of infinite time? Or will it just keep on expanding forever? And so what they did was they measured the distance, these very special kinds of objects called type 1a supernovae, which detonate with a very specific amount of brightness of energy. And so if you see a type 1a supernovae, you measure the brightness that tells you its distance. And so they were looking for all of these type 1a supernovae across the universe. And they were going to use that, you know, this one is this far away, and this long ago, and this one is that far away and this long ago. And from that they could try to measure and calculate how the expansion rate of the universe has been changing over time. And the hope was that you would measure this deceleration of the universe of all of the galaxy clusters in the universe moving away from each other. And then you could use that to figure out and answer that question. And what they found was a complete surprise. It was the opposite of what they were expecting. What they found was the regions that were distant were moving faster away from us than they should be significantly faster. 
in a way that it showed that in fact, not only the universe is not slowing down, so it's going to come to a crash back in on itself, the universe is slowing down, so it's going to just come to a halt, the universe is slowing down, but it's going to keep on expanding forever. The expansion of the universe is accelerating. And this is this idea of dark energy, and it was totally unexpected. It was like the exact opposite thing. And the astronomers were really puzzled. And it took a long time for other people to do other experiments and confirm that yes, indeed, this is true. Nobel prizes all around. Um, and there'll be more Nobel prizes when people have any idea why it's happening. So that's it. Like that's dark energy. That's the beginning and the end of it is that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And that is weird. But we don't know why it's happening. We don't know if it's explosions. We don't know if it's a fundamental nature of the universe. We don't know if it's vacuum energy. We don't know if particles are popping in and out of existence that are driving this expansion faster than we thought. We don't know if it's going to lead to a big rip. We don't know anything. We just know that it's happening. But that's how it starts. That's how these mysteries unfold is you find something that's weird and then you try to figure out why. And so there are new generations of telescopes, the Nancy Grace Roman telescope, which is probably going to be coming online later on this decade is going to be doing some of the most careful observations of the expansion rate of the universe. There's other experiments that are being built right now, the dark energy survey, there's a bunch of things like this. And they're trying to just get a sense like, is it uniform, the dark energy? Or is it happening more in one direction than the other? Has it always been constant? Like at the beginning of the universe was the amount of dark energy the same? Or has it been changing over time? Is this acceleration growing? Are we going to lead to this idea of a big rip? So astronomers are still kind of in this phase where they know what's there, but they haven't really measured it and scoped out the nature of the problem yet. And then after that comes the, so what is it? And we're not even near that either. So be patient. Your suggestions could be right. We don't know. Uh, we're going to have to find out. Cypercharged. How big is the freedom of movement of James Webb? It seems quite constrained in its movement. It can't watch anything directly away from the earth because the heat shield would not be facing the sun. So when you think about James Webb, you've got the sun, the earth, and the moon all clustered in this one spot. And then you've got the heat shield, which is facing perpendicular to the sun and the earth and the moon. And then you've got the telescope gimbling on the other side of the sun shield. And so James Webb has access to essentially half the sky, one whole half from the north down to the south. It can't see anything that is on the earth, sun, moon portion of the sky, but it can see anything it wants on the other side of the sky. And yeah, if that's all it could do, that would be a problem because it only could see half the sky. But the Earth and James Webb are orbiting around the sun. And so every month that goes by, it's able to see a new hemisphere of the sky. And six months later, it's now on the other side of the solar system from where it was in the beginning. And now it has access to the complete other hemisphere of the sky. And then six months later, it's back to its original position and can see. So James Webb is always moving and always getting access to a different part of the sky. And so the astronomers have timed this out. They said, okay, when it's July, we're going to be able to look at the constellations at the core of the Milky Way. And when it's December, we're going to be able to see Orion and things like that, just like you do here on Earth, right? The constellations are changing. The position of the sun is changing every day that goes by. In the summertime, you can see the core of the Milky Way. In the wintertime, you can see Orion and a lot of the winter constellations. And you just have to be patient. But there's always something to look at. And so that's what the James Webb astronomers are going to be doing. Paul CH52. From 100 light years away, using our present tech, would we see the Earth? Would we see the satellites in orbit as a dust cloud? Oh, that's a great question. All right. So let's see. If you went out side on this other system and looked towards the sun, you probably would just barely be able to see the sun as a star in the sky but maybe even not the sun. When we look out right now, the vast majority of the stars in the sky are big and hot and very bright and are hundreds and in some cases even thousands of light years away. While all the close stars, the ones that are smaller, red dwarfs or stars like our own sun are actually very dim. Alpha Centauri is only 
four light years away and it's not even the brightest star in the sky. So I think I'm going to go with we couldn't see it, but we'll have to double check that. So just with your own eye, you wouldn't be able to see the sun. Now, if you had a small telescope and you knew where to look, then you could totally see the sun, but you wouldn't be able to see the planets. And that's because the brightness of the sun obscures the planets around them. If you had like the new extremely large telescope with its coronagraph, which blocks the light of the sun, or if you had James Webb, which has a coronagraph on board that blocks the light of the star. And if you knew like, you knew, like, we know there's a bunch of planets there. So we're just going to spend all of our observing time looking at the star, trying to see if we can detect those planets, you could probably detect the existence of some of the planets going around the sun, we wouldn't be able to detect any of them using the traditional methods that we use, like with the radio velocity. Now, if you're perfectly lined up, then maybe you could detect as the planets were passing in front of the star, you'd be able to use the transit method. But again, it takes like three years, right to make a full confirmation that Earth is there, you see one transit, you wait a year, you see another transit, okay, there's a planet there, one third to confirm it, it's taking you three years, are you gonna dedicate three years of time, staring at this one star system to know that there's a planet there. So with the best technology that we have today, and we'll probably have in the next say 2030 years, you could detect the existence of planet Earth, you could probably detect chemicals in its atmosphere. And you might be able to get a hint that there's life on Earth based on the chemistry that's going on in the atmosphere of the planet, you definitely wouldn't be able to see any of the satellites, or anything else that humanity has created. So that's what we should be expecting to see when we look for the first exoplanets around us when we're directly observing them and trying to observe their atmospheres and so on. It's gonna take a while for us to get any kind of confirmation. And that shows you how hard it is. They're really far away. More questions in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons, Abdi Sorman, Brian Coombs, Eamon Murphy, Veloslav Atanasov, Kyle Cordes, and the rest of our 819 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Simon says 55. Did light escape the Big Bang? Or is everything still inside it? I'm trying to think of a way to answer this. All right. So like, the Big Bang is this idea that a long time ago, all of the material that we can see in the observable universe was compressed into an area that was vastly smaller, like a few centimeters across. So the entire observable universe 92 billion light years across was like an object the size of a volleyball. Now there was more universe but just the part that we can see today was a volleyball region. And then something caused that to get less dense rapidly, so that it has now stretched to the point where it's 92 billion light years across as we see today. During the first moments, the entire universe was completely opaque, light couldn't escape. It was only about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe had cooled down to the point that light could actually escape. Essentially, the universe became transparent for the first time. And all that light that acted as if it was inside a star could finally make its way out into the universe. And whenever we see this cosmic microwave background radiation, we are seeing that light, that light was released from an opaque, just becoming transparent universe, and then has been traveling for 13.8 billion years to reach our sensors or our eyeballs or whatever. And so the Big Bang is this idea of this expansion that you can roll back the universe back to this time when it was the size of this volleyball. But everything that is within our observable universe was within that region today. And nothing has changed in terms of like how much stuff there is in the universe. And so the light was there, the matter was there, the the matter that was going to emit the light was there, the light that was going to be turned into matter was there, everything was there. Um, the dark matter, everything. So light did not escape the Big Bang. Joe McCallion. Hey, Fraser, love all your work. As a student, you're responsible for a lot of my interest in space. Is there any way to support you if we can't necessarily afford it financially? Sure. Yeah, I mean, like, what I do with these videos is just a fraction of my work. Like my main job is to be the publisher of universe today, I, we have a team of 
a dozen writers who I assign stories to edit their work. I work on the newsletter. I'm sort of keeping the website going, sort of handling all of the issues that happen with Universe Today. I also do podcasts with for astronomy cast weekly space hangout as well as i do these question shows as well as the interviews although the interviews are partly to feed what we're doing with the universe today anyway uh mostly we make our money in advertising on universe today we make some money through patreon but most of it is through advertising which of course makes me a little sad because i would much rather have a website that, that was funded purely by by the fans as opposed to advertisers but you know people don't have money and i'm not going to put everything behind a paywall like i really feel like educational content should be freely available to anyone who needs it and so if you're willing to suffer through a few ads then you can get access to the content um and i don't like paywalls like i just hate them i'm i'm sure you love paywalls but i hate them so uh, yeah i mean like i think if you go to the website, then you will see advertisements and you will be contributing to what you're doing, what we're doing. If you uh, let people know about the site, if you give us nice reviews for our podcasts, if you give us thumbs up to help with the YouTube algorithm and all that kind of stuff that that people do. But, but like, I don't, it doesn't really matter. Like, if you can't afford it, that's cool because other people can and they want you as a student to be able to get access to this information and hopefully down the road you'll be able to pay it forward as well so so don't worry about it um like this is why we do it to share this information and get this out to people like you who can use it and as long as i can still keep paying the salaries of everybody who works with me and i can keep you know living this trailer lifestyle <laughs> then 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 it's all good so don't worry about it lazy beach bum are black holes really dark stars yeah like really really dark stars uh like like a black hole is just a star it's just a type of star a dead star like it was once a star it exploded the outer layers collapsed inward and smushed the center down and crunched it into so much density that the escape velocity of the star exceeds the speed of light and therefore you can't see it because it is absorbing all the light that it's trying to emit any light that's trying to get past it goes into it any matter that's trying to go past it goes into it but it really is at the heart of it just a star it was once a star and now it is whatever it is inside the event horizon and we don't really know it is a star it's definitely not a hole like like i would say a dark star is a better description than a black hole because it's not black although dark isn't great either but it's not a hole it's definitely a star so i think you're 50 percent better of explaining what these things are than black hole mike is geothermal energy possible on mars so geothermal energy requires that you tap into the hot portion of planet earth you can drill, do like hot rock geothermal, or maybe there's places where you've got geothermal vents, which are bringing hot water close to the surface, and you can tap into that and access it for energy. The problem with Mars is that it's so small, it cooled down and mostly solidified. Its internal dynamo stopped, and it's going to go a long way before you can actually access any of the hot magma region and take advantage of that heat differential. In fact, sort of one of the big tragedies is that NASA's InSight spacecraft had a probe on board that it was going to try to bang about three meters into the ground. And this probe would then measure the temperature difference to see how hot the inside of Mars is compared to the surface of Mars and measure how this temperature is changing. And that would tell us like how cooled down is the interior of Mars and would geothermal energy work? And unfortunately, that part of the mission failed. They weren't able to get the mole into the regolith on Mars, able to drive it down. It just kept sort of falling sideways or the way the regolith was packed made it not able to go into the regolith. And so they weren't able to perform the experiment and they gave up and they tried everything. Like they tried using a shovel to dig a hole and they tried to push the mole with the top of the shovel to try and get it going down and just none of it worked. And so unfortunately, like a nice definitive answer to how cold is the inside of Mars 
is not available to us yet. But hopefully some new mission will be developed. They'll come up with a different idea to try and drive a temperature probe down into the regolith of Mars and get an answer to this question. So the short answer is probably not like even here on Earth, like you could use hot rock geothermal, you just have to drill a hole that's five kilometers deep anywhere on Earth, and you can get access, but people don't do it, they'd much rather burn coal or oil or, or whatever. And yet we have almost limitless amounts of energy available to us, we just have to get cracking. While you would assume it's going to be a lot farther. And you just imagine like if we can't make a temperature probe, go three meters into the regolith on Mars, like how hard would it be for us to get a geothermal system 10 kilometers down 20 kilometers down on Mars, it's gonna be pretty tricky. So I'm going to say no. But maybe curious Borg. So how does James Webb orbit the Lagrange point if there's nothing of significant mass there for it to orbit? If you're orbiting an empty point, are you really orbiting? <laughs> Lagrange points? Oh, uh, write that on my tombstone. Um, okay. So L two, Lagrange point two is the one that James Webb is at. And that's the one that's on the far side of the Earth, like one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth on the far side of the Earth away from the sun. And so we think about the forces like what actually creates the Lagrange point is that you've got the gravity of the sun creates where a planet will orbit. And so the Earth is orbiting at 30 kilometers per second around the sun, because if you are the distance from the Earth to the sun, that is the speed that you have to orbit at. If you orbit faster than that, you move outward from the sun. If you orbit slower than that, then you fall into the sun. So Earth is in a perfect balance, the gravity of the sun is pulling it in, and its orbital velocity is trying to take it out. And it is in perfect balance. The Lagrange point two is a little bit farther away from the Earth than the sun. And so normally, if a spacecraft was out there, and the Earth wasn't there, then it would be orbiting at a slower rate. But the gravity of the Earth is pulling it a little bit forward. And it's that balance between the additional gravity of the Earth that's pulling an object a little bit forward, that creates this region, this Lagrange region. But the problem is that the Earth's orbit around the sun isn't circular. It's an ellipse. So sometimes the Earth is closer to the sun, and sometimes it's farther by a few million kilometers. And so you can't have a point, like if the Earth was in a perfect circle around the sun, then the Lagrange point would truly be a point. But instead, it is a Lagrange blob, a Lagrange region. And so now if you're gonna have a spacecraft that is in this Lagrange region, it's got to split the difference between all of the times like when the Earth is closer to the sun in December, January, and when the Earth is farther from the sun during June, the spacecraft will be in different points. And so the spacecraft is in this zone that it is just moving around, it's sort of drifting around perpendicular to the Earth's orbit, and sort of splitting the difference across the entire time. And that's part of the reason why it has to have propulsion on board, because it has to be able to get itself back into this region, being able to make these movements around this spot, this blob, this Lagrange blob, that is going around the sun with the Earth. So it is trying to stay it's the same thing with the L4 and the L5 points, right, the Trojan regions, they're not points, they are blobs. And it's like this gravity well that you can get into and roll around inside of it at different points. And it's a very large region. So you're not going to have just this tiny compact ball where all of the asteroids are all mashed together. They're all just trapped in this gravitational low point rolling around inside on different on different orbits. All time epic. Can a solar mass black hole eat a supermassive black hole? No, the whatever is the more massive black hole is doing the eating. And so in this scenario, a supermassive black hole will gobble up a solar mass black hole. But what's really happening is that black holes are merging. So you had two supermassive black holes that were orbiting around each other, and they got closer and closer, and then they merge into one 
supermassive black hole with twice the mass, they are merging into one larger. And say you have a disparity in mass, you have one that is, say, 150 times the mass of the sun and one that is 40 times the mass of the sun, these two black holes merge, and you end up with a black hole that is 190 times the mass of the sun, they are merging. And so at all times, um, whether you've got a black hole, that's only say a 10 times the mass of the sun and a black hole with a billion times the mass of the sun, they are merging. And now you have a black hole with a billion and 10 times the mass of the sun. Tropical Tom Garcia, will human intelligence ever evolve to the point when the futility of Martian habitation becomes universally apparent? It's funny. Um, I'm starting to see this pushback. Um, against Martian habitation and colonization. And a lot of people there's a big YouTuber, I forget his name. Anyway, he just did a great video talking about just how tough Martian colonization is going to be. And I think we're starting to get like as more people are getting excited, Elon Musk is wanting to get into fist fights with Putin. Um, you're getting people level heads just trying to explain just how difficult and brutal and challenging living on Mars is going to be. And I think that we're getting to this point where people will be prepared emotionally, when they see the suffering of people on Mars. And that may make us not want to go live there. So sometimes people have to make their own mistakes. Sometimes people are gonna have to go to Mars and experience the hardships. And we will be able to find out from their reports what it was like. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. It's, it's rough. Dylan Green, longtime listener, first time caller. Is there any aspect of dark matter that can't be explained by black holes? What is the reason for scientists leaning towards the wimp explanation? So you can't rule out black holes as an explanation for dark matter. If you have primordial black holes, if black holes could have been formed at the very beginning of the universe in regions of over density of varying masses. And as long as they're like within the mass of an asteroid to like a 1000 times the mass of the sun, they can explain dark matter. And so if it's a 1000 times the mass of the sun, you just need one of these black holes, every giant chunk of space, or you could have one asteroid size in every star system size amount of space, and it would explain it. And it has not been disproven. But it doesn't necessarily mean there's any evidence for it. But there are ways that you can disprove it. And so the way that astronomers are working to try and figure out if primordial black holes can explain dark matter is they're looking for gravitational lensing. So you look at a galaxy like Andromeda, you scan the whole galaxy for a long time, and you're watching for any brief flashes of light where a black hole is moving in front of a star or something else and acting like a lens. And when you have that lensing moment, it tells you the mass of the black hole that moved in front of it. And the frequency of these events will tell you whether or not black holes will explain dark matter. And so these surveys are actually being done. Astronomers are looking for it. The other thing is that if Hawking is right, the smaller black holes, ones that are smaller than say the mass of an asteroid, should have evaporated and in their final moments given off this blast of gamma radiation. And so astronomers have looked for blasts of gamma radiation out there in the universe, and they haven't seen them. So what that means is that if black holes are dark matter, then they have to be like planet mass or bigger. And they had to have been that way right from the very beginning, because that's the minimum amount of mass that could have evaporated. And so we wouldn't be able to see any evaporation events yet. And so over time, astronomers are constraining, if they are primordial black holes, then how massive they can be where they can be located, how they interact. And we may get to this point where the research in gravitational microlensing has been done so well, that it is essentially ruled off those lines have crossed and now black holes have to be less than the mass of a star and yet Hawking radiation rules out black holes larger than the mass of a star and black holes disappear as a possibility. But the way science works is that you're allowed to come up with any crazy idea you want. Sure, black holes are dark matter, no problem. You then just have to try to disprove it.
And so astronomers' time is spent attempting to disprove their own theories. And if you can't disprove it, then your theory might be right. So black holes as dark matter can't be ruled out, but there's no evidence that it is. And so more research is necessary. All right. Those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone for sending them in either on the YouTube comments or joining on the live show, which we do every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Come join, watch the show. It's about two and a half times twice the length. It's longer than the edited version, so you'll probably enjoy it. All right, we'll see you next week. If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you'll want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights, and links so you can find out more. Go to university.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to university.com slash audio or search for University Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks to all the moderators and a special thanks as always to Chad Weber and Nancy Graziano.